it's um it's amazing when when your work has that kind of efficacy um because i mean there's something about doing the work over time but um when you when you can see that you have some some result to the hard slog i mean that is that is that gives you the energy to keep going forward so one woman uh had left the school she was working in because she was so successful and been moved to another one and her approach didn't fit with the ethos of the school which was very kind of uh command and control and they and they saw her as the pink and fluffy approach mm. I told them all in day one training, the, the story I told you guys of David in Colombia. Yeah. Right. right. And um, she basically in that school, what one child had confronted her, the, 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 the students had obviously picked up that the teachers didn't respect her methods. Right. And the student, one student, you know, was very rude to her and within about one or two days every student in the school when she walked down a cor corridor they were barging her so she couldn't even walk down a corridor she was being oh, pushed right. as, she, as she walked down the corridor so she did a circle like david in columbia mm -hmm. wow and wow. she said she said with it, it just shifted it and the next day she had people knocking on her door and people coming to her and just went. Yeah. Now that I mean, see, I just think that's phenomenal. That is, that is, yeah, yeah. Because it's, I think that sometimes the um, the theory gets um gets stuck in ivory towers. So when uh, you when you can move the theory into literally, you know, put yeah. it into practice, and then you see. The, I think the other thing is that you don't need. You don't need additional things, really. You no. have the theory, and you can take that with you, and that is yeah. that is really, really remarkable. And 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 I think think it was interesting because when I had my first conversation with you guys about being a part of this, you know, at the end of it, I said, "I'm I'm so happy to be a part of this, and I so think that my work is in." And it's not my work, it's the work that I deliver right. um, is important in this sphere, but it's so simple. And, and you know, all I do is create a very simple toolkit for people to be able to use practically on a daily basis. And it, there's nothing that, this is not conceptual. No, but it's you I mean you say you say it's simple, Charlotte, but I mean it's it works. That's the thing. When you can essentialize down to the bones of something and provide something that is more likely than not going to work, that is absolutely remarkable. <laughs> well yeah. it's not a it's I mean since since we since we're still waiting on the since we're yeah. still waiting on the emails to come through, and I am looking, L tell me about tell me about the principles here, because I'm still trying to get them in my own mind. So tell me about the sorry, not the principles. Let's go through the three questions, shall so, we? I'll tell you what the principles are quickly because they underpin the right. Uh, so ultimately, in restorative, what we are doing is we are trying to align the behaviours that people exhibit in relationship with each other with what they say are their spaces, organisations, whatever's culture, cultural values. And my experience is most times the way people are in relation to each other is not aligned frequently with the values of the organization and that's often because people don't know how to do it so they're not taught how to do it mm -hmm. and so what happens is people create systems and structures but they don't actually support what needs to happen which is giving people the skills to be better in relationship with each other somebody i was training yesterday and the guy said who is 
very, very restorative in his practice. And he's the senior leader in these this group of um, alternative provision education. And he said, every conversation is an intervention. And he said that to me on day one of the training. And I have to be totally honest, it didn't really land with me. Then I gave eight teachers the training on the restorative questions from eight different alternative provision schools working with very hard to reach young people. And they went away and they all came back having exhibited examples where every conversation is an intervention. And those, those interventions, I see it like, I see it like an egg timer. I see it like a lot of stuff happens to somebody. So that's the top of the egg timer. And then you hold a conversation or you do an intervention or you do some restorative work and it causes the shift. And then you've got the bottom half of the egg timer, which is you've still got a lot of work to do, but it's from a different yeah. perspective. And you've had a shift. And even those tiny conversations that those teachers in those schools did caused a shift. And, and I think if we can hold conversations where we are constantly causing tiny, tiny shifts, there's something really beautiful about that. And that's how we can Well, I don't want to say some pat statement here, but I think it's how we can change through listening well. and really hearing, really hearing, really hearing, not just listening, really hearing. So for me, the, the, the five principles are fair process, giving everyone a voice in a no shame and no blame culture, accountability, critical, that's absolutely critical. The restorative questions are as the underpinning tool to work with in every kind of dialogue or intervention whether you're doing one-to-one -one or whether you're doing whole teams. And then the fifth one is working with, which it means that you're not doing things to people or doing things for people, you're working with them. And mm -hmm. actually that's the one that's the most difficult to get people to get their head around because so many relationships are about power and control. Right. And that working with someone is, is having both of you here and there's so much unwritten power and control. But, you know, it's so interesting when I watch and the examples I get given by by people where they go, it's interesting, Charlotte, you're talking about this, because the other day I was having, a, I'll, I'll give you an example. So a teacher says to me, you know, the other day I'm telling off a 16 year old and I'm definitely finger wagging and I'm, you know, I'm telling him off and he, and he said, I think this is what you mean, Charlotte, by working with. And he said, as I was talking, and the kid's like this. Mm, yeah. In rebellious child, completely disengaged. And he, and he said, he said, as I was talking to the child, I realized, or the young person, I realized that I was as much as at fault <clears throat> and that my approach had not been ideal either. So I said that to him. Right. That actually, I don't, I don't think I did the right thing in that situation either. And he said, that young person went, oh, that's all right, sir. And instantly we had a conversation like this. Wow. Wow. Went from that to that in an instant. That The conversation shifted because the power balance shifted. So working with is one of the most difficult parts of what we do because people don't really know how to do it. And it's difficult for me to teach it. I've got pretty good at teaching it now, how to do working with, how mm -hmm. to create environments that are with environments. Um, but basically they're high expectation, highly boundaried, highly supportive environments, but they're, they're not overly supportive. So you're not stroking people and they're not overly boundaried so that you have power and control. They're that beautiful, tenuous balance between high support and high boundaries. 
Anyway, mm. back to the restorative. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really high level. I mean, it's high level engagement and you have to be really, really skilled. If you, yeah. would, if you would give us the give us the three questions. Yeah, sure. Um, and then I have, I have some questions um, relating to getting people to be able to, to receive um, the, the teaching that you give on how to hold that balance. Wow. So the three questions are the, the old system has been what's happened. So something's gone wrong. What's happened? Um, and as you heard the other day, we had people from all over the world and I say, what's the second question? And two people immediately said the first two answers that I get wherever I work anywhere in the world, which is who's to blame and why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So normally old system, what's happened, who's to blame and why? And then the natural consequence of that is we go to sanctions and punishment mm -hmm. because of who's to blame and why, what's wrong, what's at fault, who can we blame? Mm -hmm. Then obviously it's right, fix the problem and punish the person who did it. It's, I mean, nowadays, having done this every day for so many years, I just, I can't even compute why that would make sense to people. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so new system, what's happened? Something's gone wrong. How's it impacting on everybody? What's the impact of it? Yeah. Immediately, you shift a different lens onto the problem. You take away blame. Therefore, you take away triggering shame mm -hmm. and you create a different conversation. And then what needs to happen to make it better or make it right? And where people get this wrong is they think that restorative in not being punitive means we don't hold people accountable and have consequences. And that's nonsense. Right. So when I gave the story in the talk on Sunday about a group of 50 young offenders in Colombia, a young man in that circle chose to be accountable, chose to show remorse, chose to stand up and say it was me because the environment was such that he wanted to. Mm -hmm. So you got who did it who's to blame if you want to use that system. Okay. And so you got, mm -hmm. and you got why they did it and you got remorse. Right. But by asking okay. to. Right. And removing, removing those questions from the, from the center seems to, it seems almost like, um, instead of, instead of, uh, someone, someone else was talking about moving from, um, or, uh, or a zero-sum game to a win-win situation, you know, in encapsulating the and in there. It seems that those questions remove the focus and give you so much more leverage, power, agility, all sorts. Well, I, I think one, well, I mean, yes, they do. And they do something more than that. They do something over and above that. If we look at what's going on in English universities at the moment, where you've got a lot of um, predominantly young women saying the way that I am being approached by young men or even some of the teachers or whatever is inappropriate. And you've got um, people from the black community saying the way I am being spoken to. There was an article yesterday in The Guardian about Durham University and about mm -hmm. how, I mean, you know, it's just how appallingly, unless you come from a small bracket of society, how appallingly, what appalling experiences for students that the experience of being there was. So what I'm saying is, is that, and it's based on what you're saying about the or in the end, is that where did you go if you had a problem like that up until recently? You went, what did you do with that problem? Because either it becomes about you making a complaint about it and having to prove it, and it goes into right or wrong territory. How 
is that helpful for anybody? How is that helpful for anybody? How is that? Or the, the university or college are thinking damage limitation, damage limitation. So they're immediately going into deny and defend or some kind of crazy thinking. It's all about blame and shame and it's all about right or wrong. And it's so divisive, that thinking. Whereas if you just think, I'm going to hear you, I'm going to hear your experience, I'm going to ask you what you think needs to happen to make the situation right. Right. And I'm going to invite you to co-create that solution with me. Oh, that invitation is critical, wow. Then what you're doing is giving all those students what they need because they don't want to be punitive, most of them. It's, it, you know, this generation is not like previous generations. They don't want to be punitive. They don't want to have only those two options. They want a third way. They, they know it's nonsense. They know prison doesn't work. They know it's all nonsense. They want another way of doing things. Right. Let me, let me circle back to what you said about learning, being able now after all this time to teach people to hold that, um, that space that um, facilitates engagement. What are some things that people need to learn? Or what are some of the things that you have learned to teach to enable people to hold that space? Okay, I'm thinking about that before I answer. Um... What I do, in the same way that the questions cause a different shift, I invite people to stop. I mean, do you, you must know that wonderful quote by Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning when after he was in Auschwitz, and he wrote, let me just get it so I say it right, and he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So what I do is I teach people how to look for the space and then choose a different response. And when people get it, as those eight teachers did, I, I, I wept at the session yesterday morning, nine o'clock on a Monday morning, I asked them to feedback whether they'd done anything in the last week since I taught them day one. By the end of, of half an hour, I was, I said, to you, you've completely got me, all of you, you've completely got me. Because the level of intent to try a different way was so deeply moving with such a marginalized group of young people. It was so deeply moving. And I think that if we can, it, it, I think what I do is I show people to, just look for the space and then create a different response. Wow. Look for the space. I'm gonna take I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna that is I'm gonna take that look for the space. Thank you so much. That is um that has been amazingly insightful. I'm looking at the time now and we have just about five minutes. So I'm going to if it's okay with you I will invite anyone who has a burning question to um to ask it now um or let me see if i can have a look at the chat and see if anyone has um we have people from all over this morning i know michael is in indonesia um yolanda is in the netherlands adam is in uh, mexico and yolanda was with us on sunday hello yolanda it's very nice to hear you I didn't realize we had other people listening in. I'm, I'm, um, they, they, listen, the, the conversation was so engaging. They snuck in. We, yes. we, we put that, we put that down all to you. Uh, okay. so any, any questions, uh, for Charlotte this morning? Hey, Yolanda. Uh, good morning, Charlotte. Hi. I haven't read your email yet. I apologize. It's, I, it's, there's enough I'm, time. I'm there's a, enough a busy day. Busy day. <laughs> uh, I, I totally understand. And, um, I'm just, no, I'm a slow uh, di digester. I'm just like so in awe and so no burning questions. I'm just um, yeah, excited to learn more about, you know, I've been calling myself and I listen all that the space maker. And ah. I've been yes. <laughs> oh, and, and Adam as well, uh, who's also um, 
journal audio and uh, and I've been looking for what kind of space can I make that specific difference yes and I've been really like I'm almost crying now but I've been really touched but what you uh, shared and and uh, because um, yeah I won't go <laughs> won't go too no. much into it but it's it's thank you um, I think I found my space where I want to come to make that contribution to make people feel safe and feel powerful again by yes. co-creating those new responses okay yeah. it what you just said there safe and powerful again by co-creating those new responses that's it what you just said there is it yeah. that's what we do come join me come join me <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm seconding that. Not not even, absolutely, absolutely. I think that, I think, you know, I think that that is as fine a, a, a spot to leave that conversation on as any. So I'm going to say thank you ever so much, Charlotte, for, you know, jumping on on your telephone at, mm -hmm. you know, whatever time. What, what time is it where you are now? Oh, so it was dark when I started, but it's light now. Okay. <laughs> It, it's still, it's still dark. It's still well, dark for me. I, I mean, to be honest, Alyssa, I, whenever I go into talking about this stuff, I, I, it's early. I could be in bed, whatever. I start talking about it, and I'm just instantly reminded of why I do what I do, and I can't mm. stop myself getting mm. ridiculously excited because every day when I work with people, I hear crazy stories like yesterday. So, you know, why wouldn't I get up at seven o'clock in the morning to talk to you about this stuff? Why wouldn't I? 